Hello and welcome to Palace Confidential, your weekly look at all things royal, brought to you by The Mail. This week we'll have a new crown controversy, more on Meghan's lawsuit, and we've had a lot of comments from you about that, and more on the torturous path to the coronation. I'll be discussing all this and more with The Mail on Sunday's editor-at-large, Charlotte Griffiths, and the late Queen's former press secretary, Dickie Arbiter. Very warm welcome to both of you. Glad you could be here. We'll also hear some of your comments, so look forward to that. And speaking of comments, we had a lot of interesting ones about how we covered the lawsuit that the Duchess of Sussex received from her half-sister, Samantha Markle. Thank you for those. Now, the US legal system is obviously a little different from the one we have over here, so we asked lawyer Paul Britton to explain what to expect. Yeah, there, so there's a slight crossover with depositions and discovery because discovery is looking for evidence. It's finding documents, uh, whether they be an email or something in paper or a book. Um, a deposition is where, in, in, in England, nonetheless, you would go to the court, you'd make an application to court during the proceedings, and you would say to the judge, look, we want to conduct a deposition. That's what the evidence is called at the end. And the person attending the deposition is called the deponent. So I might say, um, I, I want to conduct a deposition of Samantha, and I would like it to either be done in court with a judge or by someone appointed by the court, or as we see in a lot of American sitcoms like uh, Suits, in the offices of lawyers. That's very rare um, to happen in, in the UK because there's just so many factors that could muddy the water and make it messy. And what you don't want to do is to go through that process, which is quite expensive uh, and time consuming, to end up with a bit of evidence that you don't want to use. It, here, we only really use depositions if in inheritance cases, for example, where there might be a witness who's quite elderly and the trial could be a year, year and a half away and you might have concerns that they're going to pass away um, and they won't make it to the final trial. So you'll say, can we have a, can we conduct a deposition of this person? Um, so will they be frightened of one or the other? Knowing that Meghan and Harry, you know, they, they kind of take everything in their stride. So probably neither one more than the other. The, most of the documents are already out there in circulation, so they know what they're facing. The deposition, are they going to slip up? There's a chance. If the trial is live and in the States they like to broadcast their hearings, then of course when the evidence is put up on the screen, then everybody will be able to see that deposition. If it gets that far, it may settle before then. Uh, and if it does, then it's unlikely that anyone will ever see that evidence. Well, I spoke to some friends in, in the States this morning um, and they tell me that it can be anything between six months uh, and a year. But there have been cases that they've known that have dragged on and on when they're terribly complicated up to the six or seven year mark. If the evidence is if the evidence is already there and everything's established and there's not many contentions and we can and we can clearly see what the issues are, then six to 12 months in the States. So, uh, how will uh, Meghan and Harry deal with it? I mean, Meghan is a, a well-versed actress. Harry's used to being in the public eye. So I'm sure they will take it in their stride and deal with it very well. Paul Britton there. Now let's bring my panel in. Dickie, whatever the outcome of this one, it's really going to attract attention that the Sussexes would rather live without, isn't it? Well, there's been so much attention on the Sussexes that they brought about on themselves that uh, I suppose it's rather refreshing for somebody else to bring a bit, <laughs> bit of attention on them for, for other reasons. Yeah, it's going to open up the whole thing. How long is it going to go on? Is it going to make headlines over here in the UK? Is it going to sort of knock the coronation uh, news sideways? We have to wait and see. It's a bit of a minefield, this whole thing. It's a bit like, as I say, walking through a minefield that's only been half cleared. Mm -hmm. uh, and we really have to wait and see what comes out of Florida, what the judge is going to sum up on. It's a very difficult issue, um, and I think it's one that we need to steer clear until we know exactly what is going to come out of it, whether Samantha Markle is going to get her $75,000. Not a lot of money, is it, uh, given that the Sussexes... I wouldn't Sussexes, knock it back. Yeah. You, know, you wouldn't knock it back, but mm. uh, given the, the Sussexes have made so much money anyway, uh, it seems rather paltry by comparison. Whether she's going to win or not, that's for the judge to decide. It's fascinating, isn't it? And Charlotte, whatever you think about, you know, who's in the right and who's in the wrong, yeah. it's really so sad, isn't it, that both Meghan and Harry seem so estranged from their families. 
Yeah, I mean, the thing is about Samantha that Megan says is that I've never really, I've always been estranged from her. She says, I've never really known Samantha very well. And Samantha's saying, well, that's not quite true. And pictures have emerged since from Thomas Markle's collection showing that they did know each other a little bit. Um, but is it a very, it's not like, you know, sort of William and Harry who have these really close brothers who have broken up. I mean, you can tell that they, they're not that close. Well, and there's but quite it's just a messy. big age difference as well, isn't there? Yeah. Which, you know, facilitates that sometimes. Yeah. I think it's yeah. a bit sad, but it's it's mostly just sort of messy and a bit sort of grubby. And, and as you say, it's just for $75,000. It just feels like a bit of mischief making from Samantha. I don't always come down on the side of Megan on these kind of things, but um, I don't think it's the biggest tragedy of this whole scenario. Mm. Well, Dickie, let's move on to the coronation now. And we've had some conflicting reports. Some say the palace are expecting the Sussexes. Sus it's really hard to say the Sussexes. <laughs> some, some people are saying the palace are expecting them to attend, while others, another suggest that they still haven't made up their mind. Where, where are we with it all? I think firstly it's easiest to say the Count and Countess of Montecito. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try that next time. Um, yeah. But where are we? Well, we don't know. Um, are they going to come? It's the uh, $100,000 question. Um, and we have to wait and see. Uh, if they do come, I don't think it's they. I think it'll be him rather than her. It's, it's a big question mark at the moment. Uh, personally, I think it, they're better off not coming. They don't want to deflect uh, from what is the big occasion, the coronation. They did keep a very low profile last year at uh, his grandmother's funeral in uh, September. So personally, I would prefer that they didn't come. In fairness to them, though, Dickie, whether or not they do or do not attend, it, that's, it, it, it will generate press comment. It will still generate press comments, but I think on the day, on the 6th of May, everybody will be focused on the coronation, who's there, who is not there yet. The Sussexes might not be there, but there'd be a lot of other people who probably expected to be there but won't be there. Take the, the 53 coronation, there were 8,000 in Westminster Abbey. You had all the hereditary peers, all their spouses, all the MPs, everybody else who wasn't a hereditary peer that might have been in the House of Lords. I mean, it was, it was a glittering occasion of, of uniforms and ermines and coronets. Uh, this one won't be. Uh, it would be glittering, but there won't be so much ermine. There won't be so many coronets. Uh, mm. There'll be people in day suits or, or morning suit. Mm. Charlotte, uh, do you think that the palace should just make a decision on this? Is that is that something that's in their gift to do? Let's just surely they want to end speculation and just make this go away. Yeah, they probably do want to end speculation, and it's annoying for them because I, I actually think Meghan and Harry probably haven't made up their minds either. I think Meghan should go in some ways because uh, Charles walked her down the aisle, so she she should be there to support yeah, but you him. Was a slap in the face afterwards, though, wasn't it? Yeah, um, yeah. I think that all that was well stage managed. Quite yeah, frankly. yeah. Well, the reflection only walked probably half was. The aisle. Yeah, 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 because she has to be independent for the first half. Yeah. But um, I think they probably would love to end the speculation by making a hard decision, but they can't make a firm decision because they can't say you're banned. It would make them look terrible. It would make Charles look cruel. And, uh, and they've sort of said you are welcome, but they haven't sent the invitations out and they just don't know whether Harry and Meghan will accept. It would be very embarrassing for them if Harry and Meghan make a show of refusing the invitation. So I think that's why they're allowing the speculation to keep going, because they're just... They're stuck in this no man's land. And, you and your gut feeling, Dickie, is that Harry will come on his own? If he does, if, if there is a presence, it'll be Harry on his own. But don't you think Meghan will just love the opportunity to wear some sort of fabulous uh, outfit and, and on one single tear yeah, will but come she down? she won't want to leave Archie on his birthday. Oh, I suppose. Well, she could bring him over to the UK, couldn't she? And sort of uh, she break could, away from him yeah, for a couple of hours? Yeah, she could do. I don't know. I, I think personally, I would. If, if there is going to be a presence, then it should be Harry only. Yeah, maybe that's wise. <laughs> well, we don't have much longer to wait now. The weeks keep rolling on. But let's yeah. hear some of your thoughts now. We'll stick with the coronation debate for the first one. And Cecil Formby writes, I grew up in Sydney, Australia. Well, me too, Cecil. And everyone I know supports the British monarchy. However, I think King Charles needs to put the nation's interest ahead of any family loyalty. And after our own Richard Eden on holiday this week questioned why Prince Harry's royal protection officers did nothing about the drug use he wrote about in spare, Philip Edwards had this to say, is Richard Eden the only journalist who is prepared to ask the important question. Oh, you'll love that, won't he? Who knew about the drugs? I'm sure the close protection officers did not sit on the issue. The reporting would have gone through governmental processes. Well, as I said, Richard's on holiday. I know he'll be watching. Hi, Dickie. And we will, he will be pleased to hear that. Meanwhile, after our discussion about Prince Andrew's potential memoirs, Gothic writer wrote this. So, 
I apologize, but it has to be done. Title suggestions for Prince Andrew's book. Bear, glare, affair, despair, ensnare, nightmare, repair. What a poet you are. Well, we love slash a little bit terrified by all of those that we welcome any other viewers to share their titles for Andrew's possible autobiography. Please keep those coming and questions coming in with comments. Leave them below. Email us on palace at mailplus.co.uk or let us know on social media where we are at mailplus. Let's get back to my panel now and Charlotte, an update now on Prince Andrew's role in the coronation. <laughs> yeah. uh, your paper at the weekend dampening any hopes that he might have of playing a part there. Well, there is, there is no role. He's not a working royal. So if they've banned him from doing his ceremonial duties for the army and so things... a little seat up the back just to, with a little bit of popcorn oh. to watch the whole thing? Well, he's, I'm sure he can attend, can't he, Dickie? But he I can think, attend. But, oh, God, yeah. it would be so embarrassing if he turned up wearing, you know, the feather and the whole kit. I think he needs to turn up in a suit. Maybe they could find that candle that they found for <laughs> Meghan <laughs> during the coronation. Just place it in front of his face. He's, but a, no, he's a bit no bigger than Meghan. Might need two candles. <laughs> Yeah, 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 two candles yeah. on the bus. Yeah. No, there's no role for him. Of course they can't have, find a role for him at the, at the coronation. It would be ridiculous. He's not a working royal. Something we've discussed on this show, Dickie, is you know, Andrew's impatience to get back to his old role. Now, as a communication specialist, do you think that would be wise? No, it's not wise at all. And it's not even wise even thinking about it or even canvassing friends to say that's what you want to do or well, that's what he wants to do is to get back to his old role in some form or another to get some of his military appointments back it's not going to happen he he has been judged by the public he's not guilty of anything but there's been so much about him about his relationship with Jeffrey Epstein, his alleged relationship with uh, Virginia Guffrey, that you can't just sweep it under the carpet. And what he should be doing, and quite interesting, I, I said this months ago, that he should be doing something that, like uh, um, John Profumo did uh, when he was disgraced in Parliament for sleeping with uh, call girls, is go away, do something voluntarily, um, John Profumo, Toynbee Hall and he just worked quietly. He didn't seek any fanfare, he didn't seek any plaudits, he just got on with it and Andrew can do, could do that. The trouble is Andrew's makeup won't allow him to do that because he wants to be noticed all the time, which is why his friends are coming out oh, all the time. Oh, he's been noticed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but his friends are coming out all the time saying, yes, this is what he wants to do. Just go away, go and play golf, go and fish, go and watch videos, go and do the garden, but don't keep hammering on about coming back because there's no way back. Let, let's move on, Charlotte. There's been some speculation about Camilla this week and what crown she might wear for the coronation as Queen Consort. But she's moved to dampen some speculation and any controversy there this week. Yeah, so there's, um, it's traditional that um, a new crown would be made, but actually we were talking about this earlier. The tradition goes back quite a long way, so um, it's pretty actually unlikely she would have had a new crown made for this coronation. It's 2023, there's a whole wardrobe of crowns to choose from. So she's chosen to repurpose an old crown without the court nor diamond, which we talked about on the show before. Um, you know, it would have been a really controversial choice. So it's yeah. just a very easy decision to make. Don't make a new crown at the cost of lots of money to the taxpayer, don't use a controversial diamond whose ownership is under much speculation. Easy peasy, another PR win. It is a total PR win. At the end of the day, you talked about speculation. Speculation was created by newspapers because there is such a, as Charlotte said, a big <laughs> a wardrobe in, in uh, well, Tower of London. It's a natural question to ask what's going to be on, you know, we, mm. don't, we don't see coronation very often. No, we we haven't seen one for 70 years. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and, and even then there wasn't an additional crown because there was only one crown for the Queen and that was uh, um, uh, St Edward's crown. And then after that, the Imperial straight crown. But no, it, it was too early to start speculating as what she was going to wear uh, and thinking, well, Buckingham Palace have made the right decision. At the end of the day, the decision would have been Camilla's, what she wants to wear, what she feels comfortable in wearing. And she chose uh, Queen Mary's crown. And she's quite a no-frills person. So she wouldn't have, I can't imagine her sort of insisting on having a ginormous golf ball sized diamond in her crown. But do you imagine, because uh, I imagine there's probably lots of decisions, particularly around the coronation, where Charles and Camilla 
are always thinking about the possible pitfalls and how, how mm. they could you know, put, put effort into not rocking any boats. Absolutely. We're living in very tight, restrained political and, and, and economic times. So the very idea of creating a new crown would have been kicked into touch immediately, looking at what there is. The king is committed to the, the St. Edward's crown and the imperial state crown. There are no other crowns for crowning the sovereign. Uh, and for wearing afterwards. But for the consort, there's a whole collection, as Charlotte was saying, How in, fabulous. in Tower of How London. Nice. Yeah. Have a choice. It, yeah. is, it is fabulous to have a choice, but Camilla has chosen the right one, Queen Mary's crown that was created for the 1911 coronation. And when would, do we know when the last time that would have been worn? Was it 1911? For a coronation, yes, yeah. certainly. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't. There was one made for Queen Elizabeth at the King, her husband, King George VI coronation in 1937. But no, Queen Mary's uh, crown for a coronation, it was the last time it was worn. So long time ago, 112 years ago. Well done for that, Matt Sticky. I'm mm -hmm. not good so maths. good at that, but I, <laughs> I love a crown. I'm excited. I can't yeah. wait. Um, do you think, Dickie, you've spent a long time working for one monarch, you were press secretary to Charles too for a while, and what's your assessment of the King's first few months? I think he's done a terrific job. If you look at the day after the news came through that the Queen had died, he hit the ground running at Buckingham Palace, he did a walkabout, he didn't flinch when somebody in the crowd pulled him forward to give him a peck on the cheek. His protection officers didn't interfere either. Meanwhile, Camilla was at the other end of, of, of spectators doing the same thing. He gave a a, a cracking first address that he addressed every issue, uh, even sending his love to Harry and Meghan and wishing them success in California. There was the walkabout with uh, amongst spectators waiting, uh, and mourners waiting to go into Westminster Abbey to view the coffin. There was another walkabout. Uh, he stopped the car halfway up the mall, got out and did another walkabout. And he's been doing up and down the country, he's been doing engagements, he's been doing audiences, he's been doing receptions, he's been doing investitures. Uh, and who can forget last week uh, that meeting with uh, Voldemar Zelensky. Um, mm. He in a suit, Walensky, Walensky in his army fatigues. Mm. I mean, great picture. Um, so he's done a terrific job. He is a people person. He's always been a people person. But, you know, when you've got glamorous royals, they're a lot more uh, newsworthy than somebody in their 60s and 70s. But he's always been a people person, particularly with the Prince's Trust. The youngsters loved him when they visited, uh, when he visited a camp that they used to do years ago. Uh, so he's done a good job, he will continue to do a good job, and uh, he's had a good teacher. It's fascinating, isn't it? This just hasn't really been that much time at all. It's, it's still only a few months. Yeah, it's been a whirlwind. To think that the coronation hasn't even happened yet. It yeah. feels like it's been a year since, unfortunately, the Queen passed. But I love how Charles shows so much emotion. You know, when he laughs, his whole face cracks up and yeah. his eyebrows go up and he just chuckles. Yeah. And, you know, when he and met people from Syria, from affected by the Syria earthquake this week, you know, he looked like he was about to burst into tears. Yeah. And that's, you know, he's showing emotion, which we're not always that used to from our royals. And it's kind of nice to see. Um, Charlotte, just a final word from you on a story that you wrote at the weekend about the late Queen. Oh yeah, well this was when Charles was seen walking around with a hole in his sock when he was at a mosque a uh, week before last, it reminded me of the time that the Queen had a hole in her glove, which was not just any old event but Prince William's wedding. And anyway, she was waving out of the carriage, apparently she didn't realise the hole was in the glove until it was too late, she was in the golden carriage. Um, so you can see her waving with this big hole, and then at, the, at Westminster Abbey you can see that she holds her hand over the hole in quite a lot of pictures. Anyway. So we dug up those pictures for the for the Mail on Sunday on the weekend. And a friend of mine who's, who was a dresser at the time said it actually was quite a controversy because she has an army of dressers and nobody noticed she had a great gaping hole. And it was a pretty major worldwide event, Prince William's wedding. It was actually the, 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 the lining that had... Yeah, the linings. The seam yeah. had come, come on stick. But you would have thought, so, well, you were there at the time, you would have thought yeah. somebody would have just checked or noticed or put a spare pair of gloves in her bag. Well, thank you so much, Charlotte Dickey, and to you for watching, of course. But that is all we have time for this week on Palace Confidential. We will see you next week. Bye-bye.